Hey everybody, welcome to the Other People Podcast. I am Brad Listy, and I'm in Los Angeles. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you're doing okay. Happy Friday. It is time for a new flashback episode. Today, we're going to be flashing back to episode 455, my conversation with author Min Jin Lee. It first aired on March 1st. 2017. Min Jin Lee is the author of a novel entitled Pachinko. It was published in 2017 and was a finalist for the National Book Award for Fiction. It was runner-up for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, and it won the Medici Book Club Prize. Pachinko was named by the New York Times as one of the 10 best books of 2017. It was a New York Times bestseller and was also named one of the 10 best books of the year for BBC and the New York Public Library. Min Jin Lee's debut novel, Free Food for Millionaires, was a national bestseller, and her writings over the years have appeared in a variety of publications, including The New Yorker, One Story, The New York Times Magazine, The New York Times Book Review, The Times Literary Supplement, The Guardian, and elsewhere. A flashback to episode 455, my conversation with Min Jin Lee back in March of 2017. It's coming up in just a moment. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen. Hit the subscribe button. It's free. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Follow the show on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Blue Sky. If you would like to receive my weekly email newsletter, you can sign up for it over at bradlisty.substack.com. It's free. And if you want to join the Other People Patreon community, that would be ideal. You can do so at patreon.com slash otherpplpod. Help keep this show going into the future. Today's episode is brought to you by Lit Friends a new podcast that celebrates literary friendship. Every episode of Lit Friends features two writers who are friends, both on and off the page. They discuss craft, the writing life, and their unique friendship. For example, Angela Flournoy talks about giving birth in Justin Torres's L.A. bathroom. Melissa Phoebos and Donica Kelly uncover seduction in art. And George Saunders and Paula Saunders share their spirituality. From bad reviews to sexy emails, miracles in bathtubs, and tender invitations in response to unfathomable grief, these connections remind us why we do this work and who keeps us going. Listen to Lit Friends wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Okay, so it is time for today's flashback. Once again, we are going to be revisiting episode 455. I will be sharing an outtake from my conversation with author Min Jin Lee. Episode 455 first aired on March 1st, 2017. A reminder that the full episode is available in the feed. So if you like what you hear, and you want some more, if you want to hear the full conversation with Min Jin Lee, just look for episode 455, wherever you get your podcasts. So I think that does it. Let's get going with today's flashback. Here I am talking with Min Jin Lee. You spent 30 years nursing this. Yes. That's a long, I mean, I know. No, the, I need my head checked. Like, yeah. like, 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 yeah, <laughs> like a decade, 12 years, 15 years, you hear, you know, for some of these longer gestational periods mm-hmm. for a novel, but 30 years is exceptionally long. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about uh, why it took so long and how it came to be? I think it took a really long time because I didn't think I had the chops for it. I start, I got the idea in 89. I started in 95. I wrote an entire draft based upon academic research, and that draft didn't work as a novel. It worked as a very accurate manuscript of thoughts, sort of in the pretext of a novel. But I knew because I'm a good reader, I was always a a reader first, 
And I think that that gave me a certain confidence of at least testing out whether or not it's a good book. And I knew that it was it didn't work. And there was a second manuscript I wrote. The first novel manuscript called Revival of the Senses was even worse than that other book. So, And that was the one that was rejected by everybody. Every single respectable publisher rejected Revival of the Senses. I could say at least they were respectable publishers. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of like all the good-looking guys didn't want to go out with you. You're like, oh, okay. <laughs> that makes me feel better. <laughs> They're really appealing, but they didn't want to go out with you. But whatever. Uh, and then the second book was The Bachinko, the uh, 1.0. And then I wrote Free Food for Millionaires after I read A House for Mr. Biswas by V.S. Paul. After I read that book, I thought, you know, I'm going to write about people from my community. And which, it's okay. which is in Queens. Yes, because I grew up in Elmhurst, Queens. And oh. I thought, I'm going to write about the Koreans who are from Elmhurst, Queens, who want to leave Elmhurst, Queens, and what happens. And I wanted to critique consumerism and capitalism and the American dream. So I decided, why don't I just try that? So that's what I wrote, Free Food for Millionaires. And then... And that worked. Yes. I, I think it did work. It was well-received. It sold well. and It's a great title. Thank you. And I think that I was happy with it because the thing that I was really trying to do was to also learn how to write in the third um, person omniscient point of view, like in the 19th century novels that I had loved the most. Why, is, why is that? You love the 19th century social novel, right? I do. Why? I do. Because I think I have a lot of thoughts about society. And for me, the 19th century novelist really tackled it through a community novel. I think... I'm not that interested in just me. I'm really interested in the dynamic of you and me and this room and the city and this town of the child across the hall from us. I'm interested in all of our trajectories and how dynamically they work together. And I'm also interested in the social commentaries of you and me and the child over there. That's very important to me. And that's just the way I'm sort of designed. I think, I think everybody's really different. Like I love single point of view novels too. But the one that I wanted to write were, were these kind of big social commentary books. I think it's because those are the first books that I really learned how to read. I mean, I'm not originally born in this country. So I learned how to read and write and speak really through Where books. were you born? Oh, in Korea. Okay. So I came when I was seven and a half. So I learned mostly how to read and write by reading old books that were available at my local library. And I think I went through them very quickly. So I feel very comfortable in that world. I feel comfortable also with plot. I really love plot. You outline? I do. I outline. I write character profiles. All, I, all before you start? Or, or do you do it as you go? Kind of, you know? I don't do it exhaustively. I actually do it. And I. one of the things I think is very helpful for me, and when people ask me about outlining... I always say that people should not get too attached to things, to not be too meticulous and to be more open. So I might say, Brad and Min are in a room and they're talking to each other and they disagree about a painting. We have conflict, we have characters, we have setting. That's all I need to know. Right. And then I start writing. But then we could be... Brad and Min agree about the painting, but then they, they dis disagree about what to have for dinner. But there's always some sort of conflict. And you can, and you can deviate from the outline. Yeah, because I didn't spend that much time on I mean, it could, I kind of think back of the cocktail napkin is a way to go. Yeah. And erasing is good. And never buying terribly expensive paper or beautiful journals. I kind of think... Or nice pens. <laughs> yes. I just think all that stuff will just make you feel really self-conscious. Right. So I think a lot of times I also tell myself that no one's going to read it anyway. So what does it matter? And I try to keep a low overhead. That helps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you, you wrote how many drafts of this? Three? A pachinko? Yeah. Full drafts? Yeah. Oh, gosh. A dozen. A dozen. Does, but, uh, yeah, but in terms of like a true, truly a different draft, three. Three. But then when I, when I finally hit the draft, I had to write them over and over again because I'm constantly revising. And you went to, you moved to Japan. You lived abroad mm -hmm. for a few years. From 2007 to 2011. And that's where you wrote this or wrote yes. the book that we're now, yes. that's now out on, on exactly. shelves. So then that's when I wrote the story draft. That's correct. So I guess I think of it as... 
let's say there was a novel about us. And then I thought, oh, it's a novel about Brad and you men. Keep, you keep talking about this. Is this going to happen? <laughs> you never know. <laughs> <laughs> I would be very flattered, I right. got to say. It'd be Brad and us and our listener, right? <laughs> Jane. So Jane, Brad, and men were in this novel. And let's say we had the story. And it was really about, let's say, ambition. We, we wrote a novel about ambition. That was the big theme that I was really trying to tackle. And let's say we were also wrote about failure, because it's something that I feel very intimately comfortable with. <laughs> <laughs> you, you and me both. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh God. Well, I think that's just part of being a writer. I, I don't really even understand people who are very successful very that's quickly. It's part of being a human in some way, somehow. But writing, yeah. I mean, especially, yeah. It's, there's something, uh, is operatic too strong of a word <laughs> about the no, I think failure it's correct. of writing? I think operatic is actually very correct. I like opera. But let's say there's this book about Brad, Jane, and men, and we're writing about ambition and failure. We wrote that draft. And then afterwards, I look at it and I think, you know, there's something really missing. And I go, oh, yes, Frank is missing. Your dad is missing. Big Frank. Big Frank is missing. All <laughs> five foot seven of him. <laughs> and then I think the story draft has to change because if, if Frank's story is in it, then all of a sudden it becomes different. I should say here that my dad uh, made a special point of telling me how much he loved Pachinko. Oh, thank you, Mr. Listy. Um, <laughs> I owe you a hug. <laughs> um, so... That 2.0 where we add Frank would automatically rip the seams off right. that draft. It's like a house of cards. Right. You pull that card in, it's just like, oh. It's gone. It's gone. What I try to do is to not get too attached to 1.0. I think that's where writers get really um, depressed. And believe me, I was despondent when I realized that the draft that I had didn't work. Yeah, so let's talk about this because yeah. this is a very... Despondency, it's, Yeah, it's a, it's a dramatic moment. You've, yeah. written, you've written an entire draft mm -hmm. of a novel, mm -hmm. which in and of itself is a huge undertaking. A sure. lot of time and energy. Um, and I've lot, given up a lot of earning power and yeah, you have, status. And you people ha have laughed at me, basically, because I made a really foolish decision and you have a lot of hope invested there's just something there's a there's an eternal hope that goes into writing a book i don't care how much of a realist you are um you, you know somewhere in the back of your mind you're always hoping that it's going to connect or that it's going to be um that frank um, will like it that, yeah, that frank is going to love it or that it's going to be the very very um i don't know the best that you can do i don't even know how to talk about it but you know what i'm saying and then you get to well, a point where... Well, because we're readers, what you're saying is you want to believe that you have a reader who wanted that book. Because it's not just our wish to write that book. Because we could keep a diary and never have any hope. We could, could actually hope that it's private. But it's not. We're writing a manuscript and we're hoping that there is a reader. And we're hoping that there's a gentle, loving reader who actually cares and feels moved by the story and entertained. And perhaps has some experience of catharsis. That's really the hope. Yeah. And when you get it, you're kind of thinking, all right, bingo, you know, awesome. But it's sort of out of the reach for most people. So I do think what's also helpful is to manage my expectations. I manage my expectations a lot just because I've had so much delay. What do you mean by that? Um, you published your first book when you were 37, right? Yeah. That's not terribly late. It's not terribly late. It's not. But... I also left my legal job when I was 25. You were a lawyer. I was a lawyer. You I was a well-paid lawyer. And I was very good at what I do because I'm very neurotic. <laughs> <laughs> See, it pays off, people. Yes. Yes. Being neurotic <laughs> makes you a very good lawyer because I can worry about everything. <laughs> yeah. Detail-oriented. Yeah, totally. I, you know, checked everything and I did all my research and I did all the due diligence that people who are powerful don't want to do. So I was actually the right person for that job. Right. And then I thought that I would leave it because I had this illness for a long time, which I don't have anymore. And I thought that I would spend my time doing something that I thought was really important. And I have to tell you that the, the crazy part about working on a book for almost 30 years, it was so informed by being a person who had an illness. You had a liver disease. I had a liver disease for over 20 years. And it got really, really bad. I had very serious cirrhosis and had all these treatments. But I think... Did you ever come close to death? Yeah. They said that I was going to die and I would ha or I'd have to get a liver transplant. And it's very difficult if you're a chronic hepatitis B carrier because you're not a good candidate. You're not a priority candidate for a liver transplant. Does it be like it won't take if you do get one? Is that it? Or I think there's such a shortage of the, the organs right. that people who have it, this the status that I had, aren't considered the priority. We're not first in the list. Yeah. 
So we tried this interferon B and it worked. And the process of taking the medication is very like chemo and it's just horrible. But it did work for me and I'm very well. So that's what, okay. What is, what is interferon B? It's a, a shot that you give yourself every day for six months. Okay. I don't even know. Yeah. Like, is it you a, just kind of go and then it's like insulin your, your hair falls out. You vomit all the time. You have diarrhea. You can't go out. You, uh, you can't really move because you have no energy. Oh God. But it gets rid of the disease. It got rid of, for me, but my doctor, Dr. McGunn said it's incredibly rare. So I was very fortunate, but the illness did make me think a lot about death at a very early age. And I think that normally I wouldn't have, I'm not a very gloomy person. I don't think I would have been looking for yeah, like, you don't strike me. You are wearing black. Yeah, I, I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's slimming, Brad. <laughs> I'm, hey, look at me. <laughs> this is what women do. We're both, we're, we're both wearing black. Just so yeah. you know. Uh, um, but no, but so what, let's talk about that because that's an interesting perspective. You spent a good portion of your youth thinking you didn't have long to live. They told me I wouldn't like I went to college and they, and the doctor at Yale New Haven hospital actually said that you will likely get cancer in your early twenties. So when I got really, really sick, when I was a lawyer, I thought, Oh, I have to rethink what I do with my time. And I think that because I'm a very I'm very stubborn about whatever I set out to do, obviously. <laughs> I can say that now <laughs> with great satisfaction. Ha -ha. I, I think I would have stayed a lawyer because I think it was so embarrassing. My father had paid a lot of money for me to go to law school, and it came at great sacrifice to him. And I think that I would have thought, you know, it's not such a terrible life. It's not cold face. Like, you go to the office, and you do some work, and there could be worse things in the world. You get paid well. You get paid really well for somebody who has almost no knowledge, really, except neurosis. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you really get paid at 24. What is it? Back then, it was $83,000, which is, like, for me, an ungodly amount of money. Yeah. And you never even had time to spend it. Like you spent it mostly on dry cleaning because you just had to change your clothes and you didn't have time to do your own wash kind of thing. Um, and I would go to work and I thought it's not so terrible. But then I thought, well, do I want to dye my desk? Not you know, this desk. Right. <laughs> not this desk. <laughs> I'll dye in another desk. <laughs> So I thought that I would learn how to write a novel and I didn't think it'd be very difficult because I had been a good student. And that was my arrogance. Like writing novels, not like learning how to write a senior thesis. Very different. So you had to have an apprenticeship just like everybody else. You yes. You, you were just going to seamlessly transition. You had to go in and learn. I thought I was going to seamlessly transition and boy, did I get my ass kicked. But you had a clarifying moment. You know, you must feel really confident in the decision because it was made in that kind of crucible, like emotionally, like... If you don't think you have very much time and you're saying to yourself, well, the clock's ticking, I should be doing something that I really love to do. What do I love to do? Mm -hmm. And you arrive at this, I don't know, that seems like firm ground or firmer ground than most people would have. I think you're right. I think you're right. So in a way, I don't want to sound like a Pollyanna, but illness did help me to make a very tough decision. I think what's interesting about most people in advanced countries, first world countries like America, is we actually have quite a lot of choices of what we do with our time. And as a matter of fact, it's overwhelming. Like I think most undergraduates in college are overwhelmed by 4,000 classes and 36 credits. It's like, I'm, how I'm, do you choose? I'm overwhelmed at the grocery store by how many different sauces there are. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's Yeah, like, that's a real concern. Why I do, do we need this I know, much? 82 hot sauces. <laughs> you're going, I do want to try them all. <laughs> There's not enough time. <laughs> there's, not, there's not enough like <laughs> hot dogs. <laughs> it's crazy. So you make this decision. You apprentice for what? A decade or, yeah, or so. Definitely. And then you publish free food for millionaires. Yep. And then you write two drafts of Pachinko. Mm -hmm. And at what we were, we were getting to this and I want to talk about the moment at which you realized that the draft you had the second draft wasn't right mm -hmm. and you had to blow it up. Yep. And you have to be, you have to be pretty cold blooded. You know, you have to be willing to say, this isn't right. I'm going to do whatever it takes to make it right. And if that means I've got to tear it down again, I got to tear it down. But emotionally that sucks. Right. I mean, did you have, moments I was so depressed. I was so depressed and despondent. And I felt like such a fool because I was not what I wasn't young. Like I was like 42 or 43. So it's not old, but it's not young. Yeah. And 
at one point we were really concerned about my husband's job and he's the one who had health insurance. And of course, like for me, I care a lot about health insurance. So I applied for a part-time creative writing teaching job for a high school, part-time, just for the health insurance. And they didn't call me back. And the person who got the job, very, very qualified young man, he has a PhD from Columbia. And I thought, oh, that's who I'm competing against. And also, I'm 42 and he's like 27. And I remember thinking, not that I deserved it. He does definitely deserved it. He actually spent way more training than I did formally with degrees and imprimaturs that said he's qualified. I felt so stupid because I thought, what can I do now? What's going to allow me to have this little quiet life? And I wasn't asking for a lot, but um, that really checked me. All right, you guys, that was my conversation with Min Jin Lee from episode 455. Episode 455 first aired on March 1st, 2017. A reminder that if you want to listen to the full conversation, you can do so. Just look for episode 455 wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more about Min Jin Lee and her wonderful books, visit minjinlee.com. Pachinko has got to be one of the best books of this century. You can follow Min Jin Lee on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Don't forget to subscribe to The Other People Show wherever you get your podcasts. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Follow me on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Blue Sky. I would love it if you signed up for my weekly email newsletter. You can do so over at bradlisty.substack.com. It is free. And if you want to join the Other People Patreon community, that would be ideal. Help support this show. Help keep it going into the future over at patreon.com slash otherpplpod. If you want to join the Other People Book Club, I have a book club. You can do that at otherppl.com. Get yourself an Other People t-shirt while you're at it. Those are available at otherppl.com as well. I have a novel out. Did you know that? It's called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything, available in trade paperback, ebook, and audiobook editions. I narrate the audiobook, so I will read it to you if you just want to sit there. Again, it's called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything. All right, so coming up on Sunday, there will be an episode. I can't tell you who it's going to be quite yet. I'm still sorting things out. So stay tuned.